four, one. Assalamu alaikum, Nisa Helpline family. Assalamu alaikum, friends and family. Good afternoon, good morning if you're out on the West Coast. Uh, it's noon time in Eastern Canada. I am going to give all our friends, all our um, Nisa Helpline audience, a minute or two to join us live. We are really, really excited to share this very important topic with you. Um, so I'm going to wait and I'm going to. If you're grabbing your coffee, if you're grabbing your lunch and you're sitting down, then know that I'm really excited to have you. Um, if you're, you know, ladies, if you're here on your own, if you have um, your nieces and your uncles and your dads and your spouses and you want to encourage them to join us tonight, um, today it's lunchtime, um, right now, then I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to gather up your family and friends and get them all on online with us. Um, as I said, we have a really um, important topic to talk about today. I'm really excited to share our guests and um, our content with you for the next hour. Get yourselves comfortable. Uh, go ahead and, and hit that share on the page so that you get your friends and family on with us as well. Um, and let's get right into it. So my name is Shaliza. I'm Nissa Helpline Operations Manager. I'm a volunteer at the Helpline. And today with me, I have um, Sister Aisha and two other guests. I'm gonna get into some more formal introductions very, very soon. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the topic and what we're here to discuss. So as you all know, Nisa Helpline takes uh, phone calls from women across North America. We offer peer counseling and referral services. And essentially what that means is that if a woman is looking for someone to talk to, if they're going through a difficult time, um, they're gonna reach out to us. And on the other end of the line, there is a peer counselor, another Muslim woman um, who is going to offer uh, support. She's going to provide, um, you know, we like to use the word counsel, but it really is peer counsel. We're also very sensitive to the word counsel because what we do is really encourage, advise, and really allow our sisters to have someone to talk to, to see them through a difficult time. Um, and, you know, that's something that we have been doing for the last seven years. Now, the last few times I was here to talk to you guys, I did mention quite a lot about the impact of COVID and what we've been seeing at the helpline, the impact that COVID is having on our Muslim families. We are, you know, we, we talked a lot about the increase in calls. So between March and June, we saw a significant increase in calls. That was a 46% increase in calls for the same period as compared to 2019. Um, mental health continues to be our, our biggest driver of calls that are coming into the helpline, domestic violence, emotional violence, abuse. Um, and as these calls come in, our counselors play a critical role in helping our, our women and girls navigate through these situations. Um, today's topic, financial literacy. So I wanted to give you some insight as to why we chose this topic as it relates to the helpline and the work that we do. So our callers are, um, you know, they're women who are placed in, you know, very difficult situations. A lot of times we are looking at calls with shelters, you know, our counselors are working with the callers to find the appropriate shelter. They're looking for um, they're looking for resources in terms of immediate financial need. And when we looked at the root cause, because it is um, Nissa Helpline, we are you know as much as we answer the calls and we see the calls increasing, our goal is to, and one of our strategic goals is to empower the community and our women with the right education for. Pre preventative solutions. And that really is the driver for our online content. We want to prevent the situations. We want to equip our girls with the right information. Um, we want to develop the right skills in our young sisters, in our young families, in our new wives, in our, in our moms, as, even as they get older in the community change, and our, sorry, our, our, our lifestyle changes. Um, so these are really critical skills that we have identified based on call drivers coming into the helpline, there's an increase in calls of women who are needing to manage their own finances, who've been put in situations where they've never had to do things like this before, um, or it's, 
it has been identified as if we had this education and skill within our community, we probably wouldn't be scouring for shelters or scouring for emergency needs as often as we do at the helpline. And that really is the um, foundation of why we chose this content. And again, we're encouraging you, if you haven't brought in your friends and family online, to go ahead and share that link to help us spread the word. I really encourage you to, to encourage your, young, your young, um, young girls in your family, your nieces. If they're not online with us right now, I see quite a few of you on the live. I'm always checking to see who's there. So if you're there and you're watching with me, go ahead and let me know. Give me salams on the, on the chat so I can see that you're there. I'm excited to have you. And with that, I do want to start to introduce my guests and get into the topic right away. So today I have um, joining with me one of our volunteers, a uh, relatively new volunteer, not quite, you know, not so, so new, but she, she is new. So I do have with me helping to host is um, Sister Aisha Malik. Sister Aisha Malik does have an educational background in journalism and HR labor studies from McMaster University. She's cur currently filling out, sorry, she's currently completing her master's of arts in counseling um, psychology at Yorkville University. Like I said, she is a volunteer. Um, she enjoys public speaking and we're really, really excited to have her join us tonight. Um, what I keep saying tonight, the lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> it's lunchtime, okay, to help um, host um, this event. So Aisha, I'm gonna pass it to you. Uh, thank you, Shaliza. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, you know, humble introduction. And um, I would like to introduce now, um, you know, our actual guest who are will be talking about, uh, you know, uh, financing, budgeting, and how it will uh, it will make a big difference in in our uh, in women's life, not just Muslim women, women in general. Uh, so. We have Jesse Reitberg. Uh, he is a co-founder of Canadian Islamic Wealth. Um, they started this company in back in 2019. However, he has been working in finance since 2012. And Jesse has graduated from Queen University and he's worked for National uh, Bank Financial, IG Wealth uh, Management. Um, and in his downtime, he likes to, you know, pray at the mosque and spend time with his family. Um, and our next uh, guest, is from uh, Munzil. His name is Mohammed Sawaf. He is a co-founder and CEO of Munzil. Um, and he has his MBA from Rotman School of Management. He also has a second master's from uh, um, focused on corporate governor governance from the Henley Business School. And currently he's wrapping up his doctorate in uh, Islamic finance. Um, he also is a, uh, does consulting for UAE governments on Islamic finance practices. And he's also the chair of advisory council of U, um, UNHCR Canada, um, where he focuses on a young leaders committee and, and builds a relationship with them to increase refugee employment and financial resources required to assist with settlement. Um, so, um, just would like to, you know, have you guys say assalamu alaikum and just a couple of words to, to say hi so, to the audience. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and thank you so much uh, to Sister Aisha and Shaliza and uh, Dua for uh, inviting us to this uh, very important session. Really look forward to it. Where did Jesse go? So, it, look, it does look like we are having technical. Um, issues with uh, brother Jesse from CIW. What we'll do is we'll definitely continue and then um, we are tech support. We'll continue to work to um, help him come back. But Mohammed, I think we can continue the conversation if you're good to continue the conversation with us. Absolutely. All right. So, um, and then our, our tech is actively looking to find, we're gonna say find Jesse back, but I really just think his internet kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the fun that's the fun part of online right like you're one minute everything is perfectly fine and then for a second it just drops but inshallah we will get jesse back so that's that's all good um you know brother muhammad i'm, I'm gonna really um come and start the, the conversation um with some some general questions you know and we shared a little bit earlier i shared a little bit earlier about what it means for us and why this topic is important um, and I'm really, you know, I'm going to ask you to really think about um, women in your life, like think about your mom, your sister, your wife, your daughter, if they're, um, you know, whoever are these, these critical women in your life and 
um, just imagine. So imagine that, you know, for some reason, uh, one of these uh, important ladies to you is in need of whatever the reason um, to start to money to manage her money on her own for the very first time. She's never done it before. Maybe her dad did it before. Maybe her husband did it before. Um, and situation has brought itself where she has to do this. Um, what advice would you give to dispel some of the easiness that she may feel? Uneasy. No. Yeah, thank you so much. I think um, for the audience, it's important to note that, you know, financial literacy and budgeting are, you know, key topics um, that are not disseminated into the general public, right? It's not, it's like, I don't like to call this a Muslim women thing. This is, this is an everybody thing, right? So don't feel out of place because financial literacy across North America is really, really low. They don't teach this in schools. And so, you know, we want you to be at ease with respect to that you're not alone. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think it's uh, very critical and important to have control over your own resources, right? If, if you were put in a situation where you were relying on somebody um, to manage those finances for you, um, you need to be able to take control over, over control over that as quickly as possible, meaning like, you know, uh, having at least access to that bank account so that you can start to then plan and budget those cash flows. Um, and that's very, very important. There may be people in your life around you that, um, you know, are financial advisors or accountants that may be able to help you better understand, you know, how finances from a personal level work. And these are definitely people that you should reach out to, um, to start to ask those questions. And hopefully they can, you know, start to help you along that path of financial literacy and of course, financial empowerment. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, Jesse's still not back. So I'm still, I'm going to ask you a question, Mohammed. I, so I see Jesse now, actually. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. He's playing peekaboo or something. <laughs> You're on mute, brother Jesse. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. It's this you know, primitive internet we have here in Manitoba. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, He's back, and that's great. <laughs> so let's continue on with Jesse, Aisha. Well, I'm glad that you're back, Jesse. So, um, you know, after listening to Mohammed, um, just thinking about financial literacy, I guess what I would like to ask you is that, um, you know, in simple words, what would you say are the basic principles about budgeting that um, I should know? Uh, yeah, so I'd say there's a couple things. So obviously, the number number one thing I would suggest is making making what your monthly expenses are automatic, right? So we all know that we've got you know rent to pay, perhaps a mortgage. You know, we've got our phone bill, we've got our internet, we've got our um, you know perhaps cable, our our the costs associated with our vehicles, all these other type of things. And so um, instead of like trying to write, keep track, and write down every single thing, one of the things that I always recommend my clients do is try to make all of those bills automatic. And the reason why I say that is because um, it, it it leaves once you're done paying all those bills, once all the, that money goes out the door, you are left with uh, usually a chunk of money and now you don't have to sort of plan and budget that chunk of money you can spend it however you see fit um, so with the technology we have these days uh, you know it's a little bit more difficult to, to, to set that up at the get-go but having everything going where it's supposed to go automatically is going to help you immensely when it comes to um, you know establishing your your credit score making sure your bills are paid on time and give you that freedom with the money that's left over that you don't have to, you know, watch every dollar and watch everything and you can kind of spend it on the things that, that, uh, you know, that make you happy. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that tip. Yeah. So that, like, that, that would be the big So Jesse, we're gonna, you know, we're because you you escaped us and we don't want to lose you again. We're gonna ask you the the next question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'm on my yeah. phone now. My phone's reliable, sure. but our internet isn't. I don't know what happened, to be honest. Um, okay, so I, you know, the next piece that we really want to um, uh, to to get in is that right now, you know, and I said earlier that we are getting the calls that women are trying to do this for the first time, and I think. Um, 
you know, I, I want to go down to a little bit more onto what these scenarios are. So right now, there are many women who, as a result of the pandemic, have a sudden change in income. So maybe they were working and now they've lost that full income and it's just that top up SERP, or maybe there is no income for whatever reason. Um, what tips and strategies can these women implement or just people on the whole in situations like these? So, um, you know, in the, in the work I've done with, with, uh, with uh, sisters in the past, the, the, the two most common situations I've seen are either divorce or a death. Right. And in those two situations, generally speaking, the husband has been managing the finances up until that point. And now there's this uh, immense amount of uncertainty as to how am I going to pay my bills? Are there going to be enough assets for, to, for me to provide my, my basic necessities? And if there are, where are those assets? Right. Um, so in the situations that I have dealt with, uh, the first thing I would recommend like right now today is if you are not in that situation at this present moment, prepare yourself as though you could be, right? So what does that mean? That means knowing where all of the family's financial assets are. You are entitled to a portion of those assets. You are entitled to, to have your, your basic needs as a, as a human being met. Um, so, so I, you know, what I always suggest is create something, I like to call it a death folder, right? So that if your husband passes away unexpectedly, everything, all the passwords to all the accounts are in one spot, you know where all the assets are and you know kind of the account numbers, different things like this. Um, you know, earlier in 2020, uh, one of my clients passed away unexpectedly. I've been helping the, the wife um, up until this point and this guy had had money everywhere. Like, uh, mashallah, he has a lot, but it's it's, scattered all over the place and so us tracking down and finding everything has been a, a a very you know stressful task and in that time you know I've had calls from from this uh from this woman um you know on the verge of tears because she's like I don't know you know when I'm when am I going to be able to pay my my heat bill my electric bill and whatever and so um that would be the first thing I would I would suggest is is if you are not in that situation right now prepare as though you could be right um, the second thing, if you are currently in that situation, lots of people are, I would be phoning the, the various bill collectors, the, the, the various companies um, that, that you have to pay to like hydro, uh, internet, electric, whatever, wh whatever situation you're in. And I'd, I'd be asking for um, some type of relief. I'd be asking them, hey, you know, can I postpone this? Can I get a reduction? Can I get, you know, I've lost my job. I've lost my husband. I've you know, I'm going through a divorce right now. Oh, you know, call the government if you've got taxes due and say, hey, listen, uh, you know, this is the situation I'm in. I haven't been able to to meet my basic needs with with just Serb alone because I have two or three kids that I've got to feed on top of the fact that my hours have been reduced. Um, you know, most of these places are, are fairly understanding and also they want something as opposed to nothing, right? So if, if all you can pay is maybe uh, $75 a month as opposed to 50, $150 a month, right? Like they'll take that over nothing, right? Um, so, so the first thing, prepare. The second thing, you know, negotiate, right? Um, and then the final thing would be try, and fig try to figure out a way that you can maximize um, the, the things that are coming to you. So when it comes to filing your, filing your taxes, right, most people get a, a fairly substantial amount back from the government. So sitting down with an accountant or a tax, a tax expert to help you get that, that, that maximum amount of tax return, you know, that can add some relief to you. Um, you know, applying for the, the grants and different things like that, that, um, you know, that are in place for the government and those type of things. So, um, those are all things that, that I would do kind of in the immediate term. And then after that, after kind of your basic uh, things that are going to keep your head afloat are met, then I'd start looking at ways to either increase my income, increase my savings, you know, setting up an emergency fund so that when the time, you know, if something like this happens again, you know, you've got a cushion to fall back on. Uh, generally speaking, in the financial world, that's sort of three to six months of your, your basic living expenses. So those would all be things that I would look and counsel people to do uh, in the immediate term. That's, um, Jesse, I appreciate that in-depth answer. There's so much that I, I want to kind of go back and, and deep dive on. But before I do, I do want to allow Muhammad to, you know, if there's anything else that you feel that we need to add on to um, you know, the sudden change in income scenario, what else, you know, is there anything else that you'd like to add, Mohamed? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and those are very good points um, by Brother Jesse. What I would like to add is, is really just, you know, having, having some time to sit down and really go over your expenses and, of course, what that new cash flow looks like, right? So, um, you know, we always tell people uh, if your expenses exceed your income, you're putting yourself in a negative or debt situation, right? Mm -hmm. And if your income exceeds your expenses, then you have surplus. And then it's about what do I do with that surplus? So if you understand now that, okay, well, my new income scenario is X, well, what are, what are my expenses currently? And does my income support that? And it's really just a simple exercise of, you know, writing down, well, I pay this on a monthly basis. I pay for this, I pay for this, I pay for this. And then you say, okay, well, this is the cash that's coming in. Is it enough? Is it, is it below or is it above? Okay. And if you're in a situation where let's say it's below, well, then are there, is, are there any, let's call it luxuries that we can start to cut, right? Um, you know, maybe it's that Netflix subscription or maybe it's cable TV or, you know, renegotiating your cell phone rates. There's so many things, right, that uh, you can proactively do um, that these companies are willing to, to listen to, especially if you're going to leave, right? Like they don't want their clients to leave. Um, and so, you know, there's multiple loyalty departments to renegotiate what those expenses are. And then you'll have a better understanding of, you know, if you've really like, you know, got down uh, your budget to all it can be at this point and you're still in a deficit, well, then now you have to start to look at, well, how can I supplement that income? You know, maybe there are, uh, you know, side jobs or side hustles, as they say, that a lot of people are doing these days to supplement. Maybe there are government programs or subsidies that you can enroll yourself with um, uh, or, you know, other, um, uh, you know, income generating activities um, that will allow you to support uh, your current lifestyle, right? Now, if you're in a positive or a surplus situation, then of course the decision now becomes, well, how do I save? And once I become a proper saver, I can then shift myself towards being an investor, right? And making that money work for, for me. So I'm gonna recap, um, Brother Jesse and Mohammed, and help me if I miss anything. So the first thing I, I really heard loud and clear from Brother Jesse is to prepare. Um, you know, if, if I'm not in the situation right now, if I were to ever find myself in the situation as either the two Ds, the divorce or the death and through the helpline, we have seen this. It's, it's, it's always the two Ds actually that we see. Um, so if I'm not in the situation right now, I need to prepare and some things that I can do, some actions that I can do is maybe I need to sit down with my spouse and say, show me where the money is, <laughs> if I don't currently know where that is. And it's not, um, you know, just so that like, you know, I'm going to be like, in my in my situation, I'm a mom with three kids, alhamdulillah, the home is good. If I ever, and to be quite candid with you, I don't know, I don't pay that much attention because I don't pay the bills, right? Like my husband pays the bills and whatnot. So should I ever have to do that? I'll probably be in a situation like where, like, what do I do here? <laughs> right? So definitely if, if we haven't had, if you're in a situation where you haven't had those conversations with your spouse or the person who is leading your income, sit down and have those preparation conversations is, you know, really what I heard. Um, the next piece that I, that I heard, and again, help me if I, um, if I'm not recapping correctly, but if I'm in the situation right now, I did not have the time to prepare. I do have some leeway where I can start to negotiate, maybe reach out to some of those critical bill items, those survival piece, those companies that can um, you know, share, let them know what's going on and see if I can get some um, ease on the amounts or even a payment plan to help um, ease some of the urgent needs right away. Um, and then, then I also heard, so I heard those really too impactful. Jesse, did I miss anything from you? Uh, I mean, th th those are the, those would be the, the, the it, it, like if you take nothing else away from this session, like take those two things away. Okay. Um, and then, you know, from Muhammad, what I heard is if I'm in the situation, I really need to start putting pen to paper so that I can have a visual of what my current situation is. And that's sort of the third step where I'm here. Um, and now I need to, to start to deal with this, uh, get this, figure it out, um, essentially have a proper visual on what, what I have and what I need to spend and what I'm going to do next. Absolutely. Okay, that's good. great takeaways. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. That's great, um, you know, uh, Mohammed, Jesse, and Shaliza. So I guess I would like to say that 
basically we have to normalize these conversations. You know, if you're looking at it from a psychological point of view, normalize these conversations, make it easy. Alhamdulillah for everybody to take part as a family, sit together, talk about this and, um, you know, really empower people to, and give them the confidence as, um, you know, Mohammed was saying to learn to negotiate. There's no harm in calling someone and saying, hey, uh, this is, you know, a hardship time that I'm going through. Is it possible to, you know, maybe uh, have a lower bill or can I pay it in two months or something like that? So we just need to empower our women and give them confidence to be able to have these talks, not just at home, but also to others in public. So I guess we're going to move into our next question. <laughs> I wish you had a lot of time. Um, so this question is for Mohammed. It's um, we just came up with like a, a, a case scenario specifically looking into from our call diver situation. So as you know that there are many Canadians living paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, not just Canadians, I think people general in society, I would say. Um, so say for a a single mother, you know, who's just been laid off due to pandemic and, you know, she is left with now to pay for rent or mortgage or, you know, her ne necessary bills. She has to run the household, take care of the children. Again, she's a single mom. Now, prior to this, when she was working, um, you know, she was able to put away, say, um, I'm just going to get into stats, 10% of her income, you know, for the last two years. However, now, since she has no income really, um, and living paycheck to paycheck is difficult. So what are some of the ways or advice that you can give her to deal with these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that sounds like a normal situation, especially in these times. Um, you know, the number one piece or the number one action item, I would say is, okay, if, if you've been laid off, you know, then get on to, you know, any type of government employment insurance program, right? Um, so at least to, to get your income, let's call it supplemented or subsidized from what it was before. Um, we no longer have, you know, the CAN emergency relief benefit or CERB, but, th you know, those programs have been transitioned into other multiple programs. So there would be eligibility there, number one. Number two, you know, the fact that you were saving 10% of your paycheck is great. Um, not many Canadians or even Americans, um, you know, would do that. And I always tell people, it's not about, uh, you know, how much you save, it's actually about starting, right? And so people always ask, well, how do I start, right? And I tell people, I just say, you know what, the goal is to actually save around 20% of your paycheck. That's the goal. But we need to get there at some point. So start with 5%, right? And once you get comfortable with 5%, move to 10, then 15, and then 20. And what you'll start to see is, you know, an accumulation of, of a fund or reserve funds or these emergency reserve funds for situations like this, right? So, and hopefully you've accumulated three to six months worth of expenses uh, because that's usually the typical time frame that people are able to get back on their feet, right? Now, if you can do more, then that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but you wanna be a habitual saver, right? Um, and so, you know, supplement your income or subsidize it through some sort of uh, employment insurance benefit. Um, and then, of course, you, you will have to dip into those reserves, but that's exactly what, what you, did, you did that for, right? Like, it's for this situation. So don't be upset about it, right? You know, you were prepared, you were proactive. There would, there would be other situations where people have nothing. And then, of course, you know, maybe some sort of subsidized employment insurance and they still have a shortfall, right? That's a much worse situation to be in um, than, you know, this current situation. So, uh, but, but then again, when you get back in, onto that job, you wanna be able to get back into that savings habit, right? Um, and build up those reserves and hopefully get the 20% of your paycheck. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanna talk to Jesse about this. So right just what, where uh, Mohammed left off, you said that at least that, you know, the woman, had some sort of savings. Well, there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of even students or, or, or single mothers, not just single mothers, a lot of people out there say who have zero savings and now they are struggling. They've, they've been laid off and they're struggling. Um, what are some of the tips and advice you can give to them, Jesse? Yeah, so I mean, 
and and this is kind of kind of counterintuitive, but even in a situation where you're finding yourself in a shortfall of money, I would still be trying to pay myself first. Um, you know, putting something aside every single month. And the reason I, I say that is because even in a, a, a tough situation, right? I, you know, a lot of the times we get bill collectors and all these people, you know, calling us and, you know, we have to choose between, uh, you know, paying hydro or paying water or paying uh, this and that, right? But at the end of the day, you cannot call those guys back and say, hey, you know what? I need some money for food right now, or I need some money for, uh, you know, A, B, and C, do you guys mind helping me out? They're going to be like, no, are you out of your mind? We're not doing that, right? So even in a situation where you find yourself, you're, you may be short at the end of the month, I would still be encouraging people, like if you have no savings, try to put something aside because, you know, worst case scenario, you may need to to, to get that for your groceries or you may need to go in and, and grab that for, you know, an unexpected vehicle repair or something like this. So uh, I would still, you, you know, maybe it's not that 10%, maybe it's not that 5%, maybe it's 20 bucks a month, maybe it's 10 bucks a month, maybe it's something. It doesn't seem like a lot, but at the end of the day, as I've said, uh, you know, you cannot call up Rogers or Telus or any of these guys and say, hey, you know, can you guys uh, lend me some money? I, I need to pay my bills this month. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and then the other thing I would say is like, if you are starting at zero, you've been laid off, you don't have a job, as Mohammed said, like go into those government, uh, go into those, those government um, benefits, that would be the first place I would go. The second place I would go would be to my, the companies that collect my regular bills and say, hey, here's what's happened. You know, I might be a little short this month or next month or whatever the case may be, and try to negotiate lower fees, lower rates, things like that. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is that if you are in this situation, um, you know, a lot of the times when we are working, we do develop some some uh, some higher spending habits than than what we would if we didn't have money coming in. And so an example of this is that you know two or three dollar cup of Starbucks, that seems like nothing, right? But over 30 days, that adds up, right? Uh, that, that, that $10 lunch that you, you would go for every day when you're working. And so um, all of those things do add up. And so, you know, oftentimes when I have sat down with clients who are in a bit of a tough financial situation, we kind of go through their, their, their daily spending habits. And, you know, you'll find uh, usually around 10 to 20 bucks a day that, that, kind of goes and, and you don't even realize it, right? Because every day I've been buying that coffee at Starbucks or every day I've been getting a, a you know, a bagel and a French vanilla at Tim Hortons, right? And so, but now you're not working. Now the money's tight. So you got to give that up. Like, you know, buy coffee at, at the store, make it at home, make your lunch at home. Um, you know, you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's also not forget that there are multiple charitable organizations, uh, you know, that distribute Zika, right? And, and you could fall, you know, within that eligibility of, of Zika. And, and they're there to provide funds for situations like these, right? So there's, there's no shame in that. People donate these money, uh, you know, from a Zika perspective in order for that, these organizations to find the right people to help. Right. So there's so many organizations across North America. And I'm sure like I don't know if Nissa has partnerships with certain Zika organizations, but I'm sure they have a list of people that they could refer to, uh, because, you know, even at Menzel, we have uh, a couple that we're associated with and, and we try and redirect as many people there as possible that are in need of this kind of help and would be eligible for it. Um, yeah. I'm definitely. I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Mohammed, because over the last few years, I think the one constant that we have seen in our situations is is these the help that these organizations can um, put in emergency situations. So really want to call out Islamic Relief and the National Zakat Fund, yeah. um, ITRF. They have all been uh, very supportive of the work that we do. Um, we have constantly referred and seen success stories from women in our community needing access to Zakat. And these organizations have always been um, very supportive in ensuring that the uh, women in our community don't go hungry, that our kids don't have a place that we, they, there's no, there's an avenue so that we don't get to, um, you know, the, the degree of, of the suffering kind of diminishes, right? And I'm always very grateful to these organizations for the support that we get as an organization and for the support that they offer the community. So really calling out that as well, because, um, and I think this is one of our, our conversations that we're going to have over the last over the next few weeks is how you know Islam and finance works together and these in, these institutions that we have and these um, principles that we that we live on are 
really meant so that we can uplift the community altogether. So um, really re reinforcing what Brother Muhammad said in terms of Zakat and the organizations that support us throughout North America. Do you guys also work with uh, Nisset Homes, like for actual sheltering? Yeah, so we do with oh, actually yeah. a lot of the homes. So there's, um, you know, we that that's another conversation, but I would mention here is Nisa Homes, Sakina Homes, yes. um, all of the homes within Canada and the US that are either Islamic run. The one thing that we do see quite often on the helpline though is that a lot of these homes don't have enough room, right? So we yes, do end up, that's right. you know, faultly and helping with the sisters um, not getting enough space within our Muslim run um organizations and then having to go to um, more open um, spaces and shelters. So in terms of um, the support, you know, Nisa Helpline, we work with all of these organizations, Muslim, non-Muslim, because at the end of the day, our communities are across North America. Um, Brother Jesse mentioned that he's out in Manitoba, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, there is, you know, as we look at the cities and, and the makeup of these cities, Alhamdulillah, where there are homes that are Muslim run and we work a lot with these organizations. We appreciate all of the support. And there are times when there are no Muslim organizations or mo no Muslim homes, and then we have to go to regular social services. Um, so we'll get back into the financial and budgeting questions. I'll pass it on to Jesse. Okay. Uh, what's oh, what, Sorry, what, what, Aisha. <laughs> My bad, <laughs> Aisha. <laughs> Aisha is gonna, yeah, Jesse. Um, no, that's okay. So, um, so for our audience right now, um, you know, who, um, who might not be in a financial cri crisis, because we keep talking about the pandemic, a pandemic, but if you just look at the general situation, uh, you know, we're not necessarily paying a lot of attention to money management. Um, and as I said, they're not in crisis, but um, what information would you like them to know? How would you have them focus on budgeting and money management? Um. Do you want to start, Mohammed, or should I? <laughs> it's for you, yeah. Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody who's oh, ready. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, first of all, like, you know, if you are not in crisis mode, like, alhamdulillah, that's a good thing. And I just want to, I just want to, yeah, circle back for a second there. And just, you know, the one last thing I want to point out is that if you are in crisis mode, just remember with hardship comes ease, right? So, like, you know, this will be over at some point, you know, keep your faith and there's always hope. But, um you know, for people who are not in, in crisis mode and are kind of, uh, uh, you know, in a situation where they can't, they are meeting their basic needs and they can put money aside and different things like that. Uh, the first thing I would, the first thing I would do is I would start to educate myself. Like if you are someone who already reads up on this stuff, great. But if you do not, I would learn like the absolute basics. So that like, there are a couple books I could recommend. Uh, one of my favorites is The Richest Man in Babylon. It's a really, um, kind of easy read and it gives you sort of just some basic principles of personal finance and and uh, ones that I really agree with so um, you know if you you know another good one that I that I like is called the I will teach you to be rich by Raman Sethi I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he says in there but um, just as far as you know how to make every all your bills go where they're supposed to go in an automatic fashion like that's a really good book to to um, you know, educate yourself on that, on that topic. Um, but, you know, from, from my end, what I would be doing is I would be making sure that number one, you are starting to build up that emergency fund. So three to six months worth of your expenses. Um, if you already have that, then I'd start to look at, at, at making some investments. You know, I'd, I'd be looking at uh, making investments in my tax free saving account, RSPs, things to, to minimize my taxes and max and maximize my returns. Um, and then beyond that, you know, working with your, uh, if you are in the situation where you're not in financial distress and you haven't gone through one of the two Ds, um, you know, starting to make those preparations, right? Like, you know, talking to your spouse about money, talking to your spouse about your guys' financial goals, your financial situation. Are you looking to have your kids educated? Are you looking to uh, plan that trip to Hajj? Like, what what are you what are you trying to achieve? Because like, you guys working together is going to be the going to be the best thing and the best way for you guys to to meet the goals that you have. So, um, you know, start those conversations now because you'd be surprised. Like, six months will go by. You had meant to have that talk and and you know, now we're almost in 2022, right? So uh, there's lots of things that can get in the way, but this is really, a, 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 you know, an important thing and something that, you know, you're going to have to spend your life doing, so you might as well get on it now. Would you like to add anything to that, Mohammed? Uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, what, I think there's so many like budgeting tools and apps that are out there. 
um, that you can just access. Um, you know, some of them are related to, um, you know, getting like a prepaid visa or credit card because you can actually see your spending. So, and, and, and there's, there's something to be said about consolidation, right? You know, there's, there's an important point here that Jesse made with respect to, you know, people have things everywhere. Like I, I've been in situations where I've seen people, it's like, yeah, like we have 10 bank accounts at five different banks, like why, right? So, you know, finance, financial literacy is already like uh, very low and it's a complicated subject matter. And then, you know, once we start to talk about like Islamic finance, you have to add another layer of complexity. Um, and I just like to simplify things, right? So, you know, try and keep all of your, you know, banking done at one bank, you know, even if you have like a shared account between you and your spouse, that's fine because there's visibility between the ins and outs. Um, you know, have your accounts with, you know, one, uh, you know, if, if you're working with a financial advisor, don't have multiple financial advisors because you're gonna get conflicting information. Um, you know, have one accountant and not separate accountants for each person. So these are things that just help simplify, you know, your financial affairs. And then of course you can start to, uh, you know, plan better, right? Um, you know, having, uh, you know, an estate planning uh, will and powers of attorneys is a huge thing, right? Um, especially, uh, you know, using the rules of Islam, which can make it a little bit more complicated um, is, is, is also, you know, needs to be, you know, understood in a simplified fashion and you need to have that down. So um, I would just add those two pieces with respect to kind of the budgeting tools and simplifying your financial affairs with the amount of institutions that you're working with um, and having kind of a, a will and power of attorney in place. Okay, that was, uh... Uh, you know, have to information. <laughs> Great answers. Um, you know, uh, funny thing is, Mohammed, that was gonna be our next question, anyways. Um, so, and I can open the room, uh, open the floor for uh, Jesse or you. Um, so, say if I'm, I'm new to this, you know, I don't know anything about budgeting. I don't know how to finance or nothing like that. If I'm old school, and you know, if I have a paper or a pen, what would you say? How would I start? Or if we want to go and, you know, introduce a new digital era that we're in, as you talked about some apps, um, you know, uh, how would you get me started? What's the easiest, simplest way? Yeah, so if, if you're traditional pen and paper, and you know what, I find myself sometimes doing that too, just because it provides more clarity. It's like, I know, like I write down everything that I spend that I can remember is like a monthly thing, right? It's like my cable bill, my electricity, my water, my, you know, my rent or my mortgage, my car insurance, all these things. That's where you start, right? What are these recurring payments that you have to pay on a monthly basis in terms of your current lifestyle? So those are what we call uh, fixed expenses, right? And then you have variable expenses. So variable means, well, am I drinking one coffee a month? or am I drinking 10 coffees a month, right? Um, you know, am I going out for dinner once a week or am I, you know, going out to dinner, you know, three times a week? So that's what's variable. And so what you wanna start to do is look at your history, right? Look at what happened last month, the month before and the month before that, maybe average it out and say, well, you know, and then because the realization happens like, wow, I spent this much on coffee like outside right? That's the only way it's going to start to kick in. And you're going to say to yourself, you know, this is definitely something I can cut back on, right? Or my, you know, my, my uh, out, out, like my, my outdoor lunches, like instead of homemade lunches, right? Um, so these are, so your variable costs is where you can really start to tighten those expenses um, and be able to, you know, focus on that. Because at the end of the day, you still need to pay yourself, right? So, you know, which is, which is kind of your savings. Um, and you want to save up for a rainy day and hopefully, you know, have some investments in place just in case the situations were to happen. So that's how I would do it if I was, um, you know, that traditional pen and paper type person. Mm -hmm. If you're a digitally oriented person, you know, there's apps like Mint, there's apps like, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I keep forgetting, but there's so many budgeting apps if you just go into like the app store. But what happens is you have to connect all of your bank accounts to it. And then it starts to basically itemize and group, you know, you're spending this much on meals and entertainment, you're spending this much on gas, you're spending this much on home and shelter. And then you'll start to see, okay, wow, like, you know, well, why, why, why am I spending so much on meals and entertainment? And then you start to look at that and you're just like, oh, okay, you know, uh, and then you start to hopefully make those realizations that 
you know, there are areas where you can start to cut down and you want to be disciplined in that approach. Uh, I think that's really what it, what you, it ends up teaching you. And you start to actually value more money intrinsically as well. Okay, that's great. Jesse, now whatever Muhammad said, how do you encourage, um, especially women in our household, to, to do that? How would you, you know, say if you had a sister, uh, if you have a sister and you know, your wife or your cousins, whoever, how do you get people, especially women on board to start taking power of your own financing, start using these apps or just going old school with pen and paper? Um, I, I think it really boils down to, you know, what, what's important to you, right? Um, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, as Muhammad said, we have all these tools that are available to tell us uh, what we're spending our money on, right? And so, uh, and, and the way I look at things, you either want something or you don't. So if you, if, if, you, if it's important to you to go to that daily, to go for that daily cup of coffee and all your other, you know, uh, expenses and responsibilities are, are being met, by all means, I, I would never tell someone not to do that. But if that's not important to you and you're, and you really want to go to Hajj and your, your uh, you know, daily coffee habit is impacting your ability to go to Hajj, you know, have a good hard look at, at what you're spending your money on and say, okay, what do I really want, right? Do I, you know, is, is Hajj really important? It should be. It's one of the five pillars of Islam, right? Uh, do I really, do I really want to spend, the, you know, five bucks a day on coffee or do I want to uh, help save for my kid's education? You know, do I want to spend that, that $10 a day on lunch or do I want to go visit, uh, visit, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kenya or, or, or uh, go on a trip or whatever the case may be, right? So, uh, you know, with my wife, uh, with my sister, with, with a lot of the clients I have uh, who are women, I always, I do often say like, okay, what do you, what do you want to achieve? And let's be honest with ourselves. Like if, if that cup of coffee is like your favorite thing, keep doing it like you know but if it's not and if you can live without it and you and you're trying to go to Hajj, you're trying to whatever you're trying to achieve right and that's getting in the way of you doing that then it's got to go so uh and that's and that's what i've said to and i i ha have had this conversation with my wife you know probably for two years because every single year we've had this conversation where it's like you know what i want to go i want to go back to kenya right she, she's from kenya originally right mm -hmm. and i'm like okay well what are we going to do to to achieve that are we you know are we going to keep spending money on these things that we don't necessarily need or are we going to put this money aside to go to Kenya Kenya alhamdulillah we're going in in May inshallah so um, that's what uh, so so it works right like ha ask yourself what do you really want and, and and do what needs to be done to make it happen if you need someone to kind of walk you through it you know Canadian Islamic wealth is an option Munzil is an option there's a you know there's probably 20 other options out there that's so great <laughs> that that's awesome um I think, you know, when I hear about that, I think it's, you know, I, eyes on the goal. And if the goal is as big as Hajj and as important as Hajj, definitely keep your eyes on it. I think for some of our younger sisters, if they're watching us, I know we have quite a young audience as well. Maybe it's, the, it's that new um, purse. Um, you know, if maybe it's a little bit bigger, maybe it's a house, maybe some of our newlywed sisters uh, and their spouses are watching with us because I know we have a large audience like that as well. Maybe it's your, for, your first house that you're saving for. Um, or, or whatever that is, right? But it is really just keeping your eyes on the goal. Um, I do want to, you know, give give Jesse a chance to catch his breath, and then I'll maybe I'll ask Muhammad to, um, you know, tell us a little bit about your organization. Um, I do believe you're representing Man Manzil today. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Manzil is uh, is an Islamic financing and investment platform. Uh, we're a hundred percent digitally based. Um, we're available across Canada. Um, you know, for anybody to access. And, you know, we're trying to fulfill a, a couple of gaps that we saw in, 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 within, you know, the Canadian Muslim demographic. And number one is that financial literacy. And it's not just about Islamic financial literacy, but even just basic financial literacy, like what is an RSP and what makes it halal or not halal? Uh, you know, questions like this. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of content on our website, you know, feel free to, to read up on it. Um, we do have, you know, customer service reps that um, speak multiple languages um, that obviously are the majority speaking of, of kind of the Muslims uh, across Canada. Uh, and, you know, we'll be able to help you, you know, either budget uh, for yourself, you know, look into maybe that first investment account or savings account that you're looking for. And if you want to, uh, you know, get a halal mortgage from us, then that's definitely something that we can also assist you with as part of one of your long-term goals. 
Um, so, you know, we also have like a halal prepaid visa. And again, you know, this is something that a lot of people love using because it comes with that budgeting tool uh, within it. So you can track your spending. There's also some cashback features. So you, you can get money back while you spend. Uh, and you can also build your credit score, right? There's many people that come to us where, you know, I've, I've seen situations where it's like, you know, the, the other spouse has ruined one of the spouse's credit uh, situation scenarios because, you know, they were joint on multiple payment accounts and, you know, one decided not to pay or they couldn't pay. And then now they have to rebuild it. Um, and using, you know, a prepaid visa has never been able to build a credit score, except now we can uh, with our product. So there's multiple tools that we have that can, you know, start you off small. And then as you kind of build yourself along that life cycle, more and more um, products may be attractive to, to that individual uh, or that family. Thanks for that, Mohammed. I appreciate it. So um, can you just let us know and what maybe, um, maybe our, we'll write, we'll put it in the chat as well, but what was the name of the website you said that we can go on to? Oh yes, uh, it's very simple, www.menzil.ca. So M-A-N-Z-I-L.ca. Um, and you can access everything there and, and feel free to reach out to us at any time. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. And then Jesse, tell us a little bit about CIW. Yeah, so CIW, Canadian Islamic Wealth, um, you know, we essentially, uh, I've been working in the financial services industry for the last eight years. For the last six, uh, I've been trying to focus on Islamic finance and investing. And uh, the, the reality is, you know, I, I was working at National Bank, I was working at Investors Group, and throughout that entire time, I was trying to help uh, my clients save and reach their goals in a halal way. And uh, unfortunately, you know, along the way, we did, I did butt heads with, with both of those organizations, because ultimately, you know, having to choose between what's in the best interest of the client and what's in the best interest of the firm is, was something that, that I never wanted to have to do. And so that's kind of why we, uh, me and my partner, Shiraz Ali, um, started Canadian Islamic Wealth. We wanted to make sure that Muslims could achieve their goals in a halal way and uh, kind of irrespective of, of uh, you know, what the, what the, the industry says should be done. Like we want to respect the, the, the values of Islam. And so, uh, you know, what we do for our clients, we like Munzil work with clients all across the country and we like to create financial plans for them to help them achieve their goals in a halal way. And some of those uh, commonalities are saving up for that halal mortgage, uh, saving to go out of Hajj, saving for kids education and saving for retirement. And so uh, every single one of our clients gets a financial plan and a roadmap on how they can and should invest in a halal way. And I just want to plug Munzil here for a minute because I have that co the, the Coho Halal prepaid visa and that budgeting tool in there is fantastic. So if you haven't signed up for it, sign up for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Canadian Islamic wealth, like that, that's what we're all about. You know, we, we help Muslims across the country and really like we have clients of all walks of life. We have people who are just starting out, who just graduated and are saving 50 bucks a month. And we've got clients who have well over $2 million invested with us and kind of everybody in between. We have helped the people who have gotten divorced. We have helped the people who uh, just, just had a death in the family. And so, uh, you know, no matter what your walk of life is, like we want to be able to, to help you and help you do things in a halal way. Thanks, Jesse. And, and did you have a website that you wanted to share as well? Yes. Uh, so pretty simple, CanadianIslamicWealth.com. On there, you will find all of our content. We do have, um, you know, our education center on there where we publish regular articles and videos uh, similar to what, what Mohammed has said about, you know, how, what makes RSPs halal, what makes TFSAs halal, uh, how you can, you know, do your kids' education plan in a halal way and so on. So um, yeah, CanadianIslamicWealth.com. Thanks for sharing that, um, Jesse. Uh, I do want to mention that both organizations have joined us uh, today to continue the conversation that empower women to start conversations on their own, really just to feel brave enough to know that this is something that they can handle on um, their own. Um, we truly appreciate both of you joining us and joining our, our table discussion on finance, on, on budgeting. Um, we'll continue this for the next few weeks. Uh, both organizations will continue to join us uh, two more times. I do believe there's two more sessions for us to chat through. Uh, and really, um, Nissa Helpline family, I know you're watching us and the, the big takeaway here from Nissa Helpline is that you feel encouraged, you 
feel empowered to go out there do your own research, figure out what's best for you. But we really want to put our sisters in a place where when it comes to money, when it comes to budgeting your finance, that you're not afraid. Um, and I hope that we have given you enough to spark that in you today to go and do the research on your own. Go and, you know, if it's difficult and you need some help, then reach out for that help. If you have no idea what you're um, doing, just really feel comfortable that there's some place to start what we, you know, what we deal with uh, too many times at the helpline is the situations where it's too late, right? And we're starting from, um, from our support organizations, from Zakat, helping our sisters kind of work their way up. But we really want to be in a place where our community is empowered, our girls and our wives are empowered to start conversations, to educate themselves, to put themselves in a position where we don't have to deal with the severity of these situations as often as we do. Um, and both Mohammed and Jesse, we truly appreciate you joining us to spark this conversation among our women, um, to really put our families in a better place. Um, I know the pandemic has been a difficult time for many of us. It's been, you know, we've been talking a lot about mental health over the last few months on the Nissa Helpline page. Um, the reality is the, the, fin the financial impact does contribute so much to that mental health state, right? To that emotional state, that worry. Um, and it really is, you know, our, our helpline really is dedicated to looking for the root causes and educating our women and our girls to, again, prevent, prevent these situations as much as we can. And I really do appreciate both of you joining us here today. Aisha, um, I am always in awe of you. Uh, Aisha is a really dedicated uh, volunteer. Um, we, I appreciate you take, coming on and, and helping me to host. And then we will see you all for the rest of oh no we had why do i always forget something so there's always you know some room for some questions and comments i'm just kind of skimming through the chat right now i don't see any questions but i would like to share the comments with everyone so it's great for it's great as women for us to keep money always uh for emergencies that life throws us including divorce and then great topic access and understanding basic by banking is essential so those are from our um, followers who are watching us right now. I appreciate the comments on the on the chat. Um, there's no questions, so there's no questions for, to, for us to answer. But again, if you do have a question, uh, please do reach out to us and we'll answer it. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks, um, my speakers, my hosts. Thanks for um, joining as well. Assalamu alaikum. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.